Welcome to the Fantasy Source Baseball Podcast. My name is David A.R. I'm sitting here with Brad Pinkerton. First of all, Brad, welcome back from vacation. You look very tanned, rested, everything. <laughs> tanned and ready to go. Yes, indeed. And, well, right away, you've brought up an interesting topic that I think bears, uh, bears a little bit of conversation or deserves a little bit of conversation, which is when you look at monthly splits, I think that a lot of people put way too much weight into just what somebody does in the past month. Now, that means something. It's recent performance. It's what it's close to what they're doing right now. But there's also usually with these guys a long history that they've done previously. Oh, true. And also, you want to, so a lot of these owners will look at the June stats, of course, and see before All-Star break, and they'll erase what happened before mm-hmm. June. Because once we hit that All-Star break, we'll start yes. looking at second-half splits only, and we'll kind of forget what they did early in the season. So we kind of tend to think, okay, well, what they did in June is going to carry over into the second half, and that's what I'm getting for the rest of the season. Yeah, it's a nice round or nice flat, easy cutoff point is that All-Star game. But you know what? Life is not made up of cutoff points like that. It's fluid. Things happen before that still matter. Exactly. The calendar does not dictate the stats. So let's take a look at some of these guys that you've identified as perhaps being uh, guys that that had an interesting June and owners may be wondering what they're going to be doing with them moving forward, especially considering the trade deadlines in fantasy leads are coming up. Right, and the the guys we're going to bring up here have been very useful and should be on every fantasy team. They're they're definitely very useful. But what we're looking for is an eye ahead to maybe, let's say by the end of the season, are, are we still holding these guys in as high regards? That's kind of what we're getting at here. So let's start with one of the high leverage positions at catcher, Miguel Olivo. This is a guy who historically has provided a little bit of pop from the catching position, but has not been a good average guy. Right, and that's exactly what we're seeing. We see eight home runs in June, and yet he's hitting 182. So <laughs> he, he is helping for a catcher. You like that power, but, I mean, he's, he's draining your batting average, and when that power disappears, and it will eventually disappear, then I think you're left with just a poor hitting catcher. So that's why I'm saying sell on Olivo. So even with the catcher, even as a catcher, that 182 batting average is so bad that you just don't want to deal with it. No, no, not necessarily. It's when those homers disappear. Mm-hmm. I don't think the average is going to go up to cover any sort of loss of home runs. So that's why it, once the power is gone, then you're stuck with that average. Okay, let's take a look at a first baseman, a guy who has been getting lots of attention because of how his splits have corresponded with the calendar. Since May 2nd, that nice round number, Carlos Pena is at 16 home runs, if I recall that, correct, that stat correctly. And before that, he had zero in the first month of the season. So... Again, if you're looking at a stats website that breaks it down by month, he may look like he's going game busters right now. But remember, as you said, calendar doesn't dictate the stats. Right, and this is what Carlos Pena does. He disappears, ice cold, and then reappears red hot. This, that's what he does. So right now we're seeing nine home runs in June. And he's got his average up to 244, which is good for Carlos Pena. Now, is that for the month? For the month of June. Yeah, and, that, I mean, and that's before he launched another home run today, before yes. this podcast. So yes. uh, he, he's still <laughs> swinging the bat fairly well. But I'm saying sell. I mean, we've seen this act from Carlos before. We're, we've seen him be cold. We've seen him awful this, this year already. And we're seeing him being great right now. We're going to see him be awful again by the end of the year and possibly see him be great again. It'll all average out into a Carlos Pena season. If you're okay with that, hang on to him. If you think that his June stats are going to carry over to the end of the season, I think you're you're uh, probably holding Carlos Pena in too high a regard. Let's talk about a guy who is in the National League now, a guy who a lot of people had on their radars at the beginning of the season, and he just basically um, exploded in recent days, recent weeks, Mike Morse. Mm-hmm. This guy, he came up, if I recall correctly, I remember him as a, as a Seattle Mariners shortstop prospect way back in the day. And now all of a sudden he's a halting right-hander in the almost the Jason Michaels tradition. And now he's playing some first base. He's got outfield eligibility in a lot of leads. And he's been hitting, he's been hitting game busters. Yep, and Morse really started catching fire in, in May. And I think after such a horrible April, we were all just kind of holding off and saying, well, you know, this might just be a flash in the pan. Well, through June so far, guys hitting over 300 with eight home runs, 22 ribbies. I mean, it's hard to ignore that now. So now we have to start thinking, could this be long-term? And while I think we're going to see more struggles from Morse, maybe not quite as bad as what we saw in April, this is what he's capable of doing. And I'm buying this. And unfortunately, what he's doing right now, he's probably not doing it for his original owner's teams. Those people probably gave up on him. Only the most patient would have ridden out that horrible April. But um, if you do have him now, just enjoy it while you can. Um, there probably will be some rocky 
roads coming up for Mike Morse, um, but just keep him on your roster and go with it whenever he's hitting. The other thing I would caution with Mike Morse is if you looked at his peripheral stats like the run stored and the RBIs, he's going to be in a much better lineup now that Ryan Zimmerman is back. And I mean, a huge part of that lineup. Jason Worth has struggled a little bit, having a very low batting average during the season. I think he's going to be getting better. That is a sleeping giant of, a, of an offense in the National League East. Let's talk about one more, the teammate of oh, Michael Oh, yeah, Morris, I mean, let's not even forget about the other, another infielder, Danny Espinosa. Rookie of the Year candidate, and I mean, I think he might run away with this award. Uh, this guy, he's hitting, he's up to 290 in June, which you might look at his overall batting average and think, well, no, thank you. But he, if he can continue to kind of keep that batting average above water, um, his power at second base is phenomenal. So... I think fantasy owners can do much worse than Danny Espinosa, and as a matter of fact, he is outproducing the likes of Ian Kinsler. Um, many owners are just frustratingly starting Ian Kinsler every week, and Danny Espinosa is doing better than that. And that's I kind of see that being by the end of the season, he's going to be right around the Kinsler mark. So, do you think that by the end of the season, he's going to be top five second baseman? It's going to be close. He will be he will be in the conversation. Kinsler's having a down year. You know, he has plenty of time to turn it around. He can really catch fire. But I think. We may be looking at Espinosa versus Kinsler this time next year. Uh, let's move to the National League West and a team that gets a, I mean, no, you don't really want many San Diego Padres in your lineup considering the ballpark that they play in. And I think their team batting average year in, year out is something like 240 overall because, because of that ballpark. But I, I, in one of my leads, I picked up Chase Headley off of the waiver wire because I saw his batting average was way up. And you know what I figured to myself? Even if it is a mirage, even if he's just been getting lucky all along, this is the kind of batting average. You didn't, you, if you can get that out of your third baseman, you take the chance. And on top of which, I had Sean Fiddens as my, other, as my third baseman yep. at the time. So no, no harm, no foul on that one. <laughs> yeah, so just about anything was yes, everything was better. Sean. <laughs> well, yeah, Chase, he's in 357 this month, and that's, that's great. That's, that's definitely eye-catching. Um, what I don't like is you're probably using him as your third baseman. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a good thing. He's got one homer this month, despite those, that great batting average. Um, and his runs and RBIs are always going to be low there with the Padres. Um, he'll steal you the occasional base, but you'd rather hit the occasional home run if you're talking about your third baseman. Otherwise, you can do a lot better than Chase Headley. Now, while the average is great now, I think once that dries up, um, and when it gets down to closer, he's more of a 300 hitter, maybe a little low. Uh, but once that dries up, there's not a whole lot, so it's an empty 300 average. Yeah, you got to be making you got to be making it up elsewhere in a big way if you're going to be running with him at full full right. force. Uh, I see you have him listed as a sell guy. You don't really think you don't really think that his future is all that great. What do you think about him in those deeper leagues where there are corner infield spots? Do you think you think he's just clear cut? Hey, you know, like in our experts league, we've got 12 teams. We've got corner infielder, third base, and two utils. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Use use him while he's hot. Um, he's only going to give you hits and maybe a few RBIs and steals, you know, here and there. But once that average dries up and gets down to like 200, I think you can cut him loose. One of my favorite guys is up next on your list, and I, I've started thinking about him as the the currently American lead Ty Widdington, and that's Michael Tadire because he has eligibility in Yahoo leads at something like six different positions. He's fantastic to just move in around. And if he's your everyday middle infielder or second baseman where he has eligibility in those Yahoo leads, he's putting up some really solid numbers. Yeah, he's hitting 349 this month because he's got five homers. And I think what you said about his multi position eligibility, um, that's why I'm saying buy this guy because we've seen him hit for average and power in the past. He's even chipping in a few steals. He had a three steal game uh, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> that's not going to happen very often, but you know, the, he's got the power and he's got the average. He's got the ability, and you can plug him in wherever your lineup needs him. In midseason, with all the injuries we're dealing with, you, I mean, Michael Kadire is invaluable. So I, that's buy and hold for him. And then finally, the last guy. This is somebody that uh, is having a bit of a resurgence, I guess you could say. J.J. Hardy is finding himself at the top of the Orioles lineup day in, day out. It's been something like, I don't know how many years it's been since I've been waiting for him to keep doing this again. But he's almost developed in real-life baseball as a good glove, not-so-great bat, always injured type of guy. Fantasy baseball, the injuries aren't quite as big a deal because, you know, if he's, your, if he's the 12th best shortstop in the lead, so be it. But right now, he's hitting like, he's hitting for power, he's hitting for average. What's not to like? Well, you're right. It's J.J. Hardy's a shortstop eligible with these kind of stats, hitting 370 in June with eight homers. I mean, not only is he a mixed league starter, he's a mixed league stud. But the problem is, J.J. Hardy is one of the most streaky players in fantasy baseball history. 
Um, and we're seeing him go through the hot streak right now, obviously. Um, that usually is followed by a very, very cold streak for J.J. Hardy. Um, but he is shortstop. So there, there's a very low amount of shortstops you want to have or that you could pick up off the waiver wire. You've got to use them while you can. But if somebody came knocking for a, an equitable offer for J.J. Hardy right now, I would move him in a heartbeat. So you're saying basically, like, hey, he's you got to ride it as, as much as you can. But if it even seems that like an even trade, you just roll with the I'm, trade. Roll with the trade. I'm buying JJ Hardy in the sense that I believe he is capable of these sort of streaky, you know, power production numbers. But I'm selling him in the sense that if anybody was come wanting to give me something else I could use that's more of a long term, safer long term bet, then I would take that. All right, Brad. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot.